Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes retrospective video. This is for Bob Clampett part one and there's a reason why we're dividing this one in half. Now if you're watching on YouTube please be sure to subscribe and like this video and if you're watching it on the podcast listening to it on the podcast rather make sure you give it a follow and vice versa. But you're in for a treat today because joining me today are my three good friends and I'm going to introduce you to them one by one. First up, I have my good friend, Eli Copperman. Say hi. Uh, hello there. How may I interest you in a cup of joe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Is that from a cartoon? That I don't did? even know. Probably just me, like, goofing off because I'm burnt out from too much work or something. You mean too much watching Bob Clampett cartoons? I get it. And, and, and right. the cartoons we're going to talk the, about the definitely cute, falls into as that. As you say, he's the craziest person. <laughs> There we go. And now we're also joined by my good friend, Manny Cruz. Say hi. Greetings and salutations, all you happy people. Uh, and joining <laughs> us all the way from the Netherlands, and I don't want to keep him up too late, unlike with what we did on the Dex Avery retrospective, is my good friend, Vox in the Fix. Say hi. Hi, guys. I'm uh, sleep deprived again, but I'm really glad to uh, talk about these charming cartoons. And, you know, <laughs> you can tell everyone that you're sleep deprived because you've just been watching these one after another because they're so great. Well, yeah, especially... Chicken jitters, I love that one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Whoa, don't don't get ahead of yourself. We haven't even gotten to the first one on the list. <laughs> oh yes. Whoopsie. Of course, of course. So just getting right into it, look, the reason why we're doing this in two parts is because he's done so many cartoons, way more than Tex did, and he's just gonna make an awfully long video. So for part one, we're gonna focus exclusively on his black and white unit stuff. And then of course, part two will be the um, stuff that he did when once he took over Tex Avery's unit once he left. There will still be two color cartoons here. So we will get definitely get to that as we go along. So just to start off with, look, just to give you a brief introduction on Bob. See, he originally started his career at the Harmonizing Studio in around 1931, I believe. And, you know, he was an animator. But once Harmon and Ising had basically stopped producing cartoons for Leon due to a dispute, Leon opens his own studios. And of course, uh, Bob Clampett joins that studio. So for a while, he's an animator. He works in uh, Frizz's unit. You know, he did the famous, my green fedora. The one with the uh, little rabbit called Elmer doing, you, 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 you. That's the, the one, pen. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and 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 you can sort of see that you, you you got freeze just doing whatever worked at the time or so he thought and then you got bob i think trying to push through pushing his wacky ideas and you can tell that they weren't they didn't quite gel but whatever these things do happen but later on once tex arrives though he becomes an animator at for for tex and clearly he would have learned a lot working with tex i mean wow but eventually Schlesinger needed more cartoons to fill the schedule, so he taps out our Bioworks at his studio to create some cartoons, and that's where we start with our first cartoon, everyone's favorite, and everyone's favorite side character, Porky and Gabby. Well, <laughs> no, it's a good one. Everyone's seen this one. Yes. I mean, this uh, one, yeah. <laughs> with, with Porky and Gabby, look, you can clearly see that this is not wasn't your standard Warner Brothers thing at the time because at the time, you just look at the animation, some of the scenes, you can you can see that it's done by completely different people than usual. But what do you think, Fox? I mean, you you put your name down for this one. What are your thoughts on Porky and Gabby? I actually like this one for some reasons. It has uh, some funny uh, camping frustration jokes. I think the score is great for one and. And I also kind of like Gabby. You just have to wonder how he and Porky became friends in the first place. But he's uh, certainly an interesting foil for Porky. And I like some of Up's signature work, like how he uses the thick sort of lines to show speed. Too bad the uh, restoration for this one looks so fuzzy. You know, it's it's not a great cartoon, but I think it's 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 charming enough. Yeah, it certainly is. And, it, and this one is credited to Art Bioworks, but both Chuck Jones and Bob Clamper definitely are involved in that one. As with Porky's Super Service, which is a another favorite it's the second and final one to show directing credit to our bioworks but again clamp and jones had definitely had a hand in this one so with this one yeah you just got porky at a service station and shenanigans happen yay <laughs> actually this one's not too bad but 
Eli, what are your thoughts on this one? You know, this is probably my favorite of the very, very few shorts that Ub Iwerks made for the Schlesinger studio. I think compared to Porky and Gabby, which honestly kind of frustrates me watching it, uh, this one, there are frustration gags for sure, but they feel, they have a bit more like pep to them, if, if that makes sense. The baby is like such a little jerk to Porky, like as as, <laughs> as those new mischievous babies in cartoons would be. In addition to that, like it's it's juvenile and all, but it's 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 got it, it's charming the, the right place. Yeah. Although I do, wonder how the cartoon might have turned out had Clampett had a bit more direction or creative input into it, uh, especially with like the, the, the later ones, but we'll get into that. Of course. Within. Doesn't this cartoon have a part with the uh, mother uh, smacking her own child or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, that, that joke would, would not fly by today at all. Hmm. <laughs> I can't and, and, and what makes you say that? Hmm. In, <laughs> in any case... So Abai works essentially leaves according to well, Paul. He, he doesn't leave. He's he's just done with the studio at, at that point. He got <laughs> his, so yeah, well, he got his well, free for freelance and he was done. Yeah, it was like, it was like quote unquote leave. But in any any case, uh, there was like an empty chair and Clapper basically filled it. That's according to uh, interviews with him. But the first one that was still done at, using the Abai works team more or less. But credited to Bob Clampett is Porky's Bad Time Story, which you might be for more familiar with the remake, but this one, instead of having Daffy in the later one, here it's, of course, everyone's favorite character, Gabby. We all love Gabby, right? We're, you know, we're, we're goo goo for Gabby, aren't we, boys? Don't Yay. shout. It's all right. <laughs> Don't shout all at once. <laughs> in any case, uh, you know, this one's like a little fun one where there's always that shtick in a lot of cartoons where, you know, the, a character, or in this case, characters, to try to sleep, and they're woken up by all sorts of things during the night. But Manny, you've been kind of quiet. What What are your thoughts on Porky's bad time story? Gabby, Gabby, Gabby. There's my Simpsons reference for the day. <laughs> So like many of these cartoons that are on this list, I might as well say it now before I repeat it a million times. I have such a love and charm for the black and white Porky shorts of the 30s and 40s. Mainly, most of them done by Clampett himself because I was a little kid in the 90s watching Nick Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon. And for some reason, those computer colorized and occasionally redrawn <laughs> Porky shorts from back then. And, you know, also the, some of the shorts that Tashlin did and Norm McCabe did. Just, I don't know, I always found them really charming. And this one is an example of that. I mean, what I like about Porky's Bad Time Story, and I don't know, there's days where I say TikTok Tuckered is better than this one. I mean, it's kind of cool that the same director took another spin doing the same concept. Not that anybody else would reuse the same jokes or same plots over and over again. I won't name any names for its reeling, but there's just <laughs> something about these early Clampet shorts that even though they're nowhere near as artistic and funny as the stuff he did when he took over Avery's unit but it's just it, there's a whole lot of charm to it not every joke's gonna land not every plot is gonna make any sense but there's just so much charm to it and you could tell especially early on that Clampett had all this energy well him and Jones because you know you don't want to bypass the impact that Jones had on the early shorts that they co-directed but just there's so much youthful energy in this stuff and I, every time I see this cartoon I always find it to be funny even though the the whole frustration gag or trying to sleep thing sometimes gets a little played out, but it's just, it works for me. I don't hate Gabby nearly as much as everybody else. And something I think that Fox mentioned about Porky and Gabby, that there's something about these early Clampet shorts with Porky and just in general, Stalin scores just hit so well in these cartoons. In particular, this one, I always think of the part, you know, Porky falls asleep and the water starts tripping on the bed and you start hearing September in the rain and it's just, I love the work. I mean, now as an adult, I start laughing out loud at, at the implication of the joke. But it's just what Stalling was doing in those cartoons really added a nice little flavor to it. And I would say Avery's debut in Gold Diggers of 49, Freelings with, I think, Buddy the Gob, you know, all the other directors. I would say this is arguably one of the best, if not the best, debut short that any of the Warner directors had at the time. I agree. I totally agree. But moving on to the next one is Get Rich Quick Porky, which for me, it's it's, a, it's an absolute childhood favorite, watching it in that beautiful colorized version. You know, you got to do the chef kiss every time you think about those beautiful colorized versions <laughs> that we all got stuck with. You know, this one is nice. You know, you got, of course, Gabby voiced by uh, Cal Howard in this one. 
for whatever reason. I don't know, because, you know, they, they had a clear direction with where they wanted to go with Gabby, <laughs> but in his third and final appearance. But this one's fun, and there's a lot of wonderful Chuck Jones animation in this one that I liked. And you can see that in these early ones, Chuck Jones really did have that influence on these ones like they're not they're crazy but they're not over the top crazy it's like jones sort of balanced out clamp it but that dog alone not quite as as amazing as norm ferguson's animation of pluto but still very funny Ex exactly right i mean we can all knock chuck jones's early director shorts and you know with good reason a lot of the time but we, you can't knock his beautiful animation or these earlier clamp it shorts it's just wonderful wonderful things uh, to see but moving on to rover's rival now with rover's rival they've gone from the up Bywick studio back to the schlesinger studio now so when i watched this one for my commentary series i remember this one being a little bit off you can tell that clampett he had all these ideas in his head i don't know he just couldn't he didn't quite have it down yet i think he just needed needed the practice with uh, directing and i could see what he wanted to do but this one well, a little tough for me, but Manny may beg to differ, though. Um, what, you, what are your thoughts on uh, Rover's Rival? Well, one of the things I just remembered, it is, you could argue that it's definitely more important when it comes to history as opposed to the short itself. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first cartoon that used uh, the merry-go-round broke down as the Looney Tunes theme song. I always make it a point to my non-Looney Tune fanatic aficionado geek friends that there is a difference between the merry-go-round broke down and merrily we roll along. Sorry, let me get off my soapbox for a moment. But when it comes to the cartoon itself, I recently rewatched it because I've been watching the shorts in chronological order. And when I was rewatching Rover's Rival, I'll agree that it's inconsistent. There are parts of it that I find really funny, but it's just the flow of the story itself and then like how it sets up for the ending. It's, it's a little off. It's not a bad short, but it's it's like Clampett is still figuring out his stride. Great animation. Great voice acting from Mel Blanc there. Also, Robert C. Bruce does a, a non-narrating role for once uh, as the old ah, dog. Yes. So he's... Oh, uh, wow. That guy actually had range, but no, he was... He's always going to be the, the narrator guy, isn't he? <laughs> we all know him as. <laughs> uh, but no, but no, to be fair, he was definitely good at it. Definitely. And next one was interesting, which is Porky's Hero Agency. And you know, this is one going back to Greek times. And this one kind of surprised me i i did enjoy it uh, especially with all the you know the greek references and even the references of the animators as greek figures like in statues or something or other and even the chuck jones uh reference around the beginning as well and this one i thought was a whole lot of fun but uh fox what are your thoughts on porky's hero agency yeah this one uh, surprised me as well when i saw it for the first time on the porky 101 dvd i think they had to use uh, uh different materials to piece this one together so i'm not sure if that's the reason why it's not uh, restored in hd yet i like stories like this it uh, takes place in the past and i i like history I mean, it has a kind of suspense and visually it's very interesting it's very adventurous and you can see some signs of Chuck's work, especially on some of the character designs, I think. And the backgrounds are very pretty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the greatest, but it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty not a nice one. Then we got Porky's Papa. That's the one on the farm, isn't it? The old McDonald's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's, wow. Because, you know, admittedly, some of these n names you think, oh yeah, it's that cartoon. That's right, because... Uh, I mean, it gets worse with Bugs Bunny when he, when it's like all, all hair puns have got nothing to do with the short, but this is definitely a runner-up. But uh, no, Porky's Popper, it does the whole thing with the mechanical cows like that seem to be around a lot of that time with a lot of the studios. Like, why they're literal cows, I don't know. But Manny, let me guess, you, you rock out to that wonderful uh, old McDonald bit at the beginning, right? Well, the <laughs> I mean, it's such a such a cool song, but I like in the beginning the uh, the foreshadowing to the birth of hip hop in the 1970s near the end of the song, where the record says "Oh, oh, but oh, but I can't I can't do it, oh, but oh, but oh, but oh, and then Porky slams uh, the record player on the ground. Oh boy, and then. That part always makes me laugh. And then, of course, you know, the reality of being an adult hits home when the next part is uh, talking about the mortgage and bills. And uh, when I used to watch that cartoon on Nickelodeon as a kid, I didn't know how true that sad part of the song would be as you get older. Yeah, I definitely like this short. Again, lots of energy, pretty charming. I like hearing Mel Blanc do Porky's voice unsped up for Porky's pop himself. I think the whole 
uh, storyline with the mechanical cow and Bessie and Porky's really funny. Uh, just a lot of really funny gags, like especially when you see like ice cream coming out and how they make Swiss cheese with, with the little cuckoo bird using a Tommy gun to make the holes and then the holes start. <laughs> they start so that's singing. not how they make it? I thought, no, it, that... well, I, uh, well, apparently I found out the real way it was done and I, I still prefer the little uh, bird shooting it. But <laughs> I think that's more, more, more authentic Swiss cheese. So, you know, I prefer that, that kind. Yeah. One other thing too that I always thought was strange was for some reason the ending always looked strange when Porky's Papa announces the winner and then realizes Bessie in disguise. But it looked like they took the footage from the redrawn version and just turned it into black and white. And it wasn't until we got, you know, either the Golden Collection or Porky Pig 101 that you saw the original animation for that. And for years I thought, why does this ending look so horribly drawn compared to the rest of the cartoon? Like why? Mm, that's, that's curious. Sure. Yeah, that's a, it's a bit weird, but it actually looks in, in like in decent shape on Porky 101 at least, which, you know, I still maintain despite its flaws, it's still a great set, which all of these cartoons, by the way, for those of you listening are on that set, except for the two color ones, which we'll discuss later on. But moving on to the next one, which is an interesting one, what price Porky? This cartoon is definitely the definition of, um, well, that escalated quickly. You know, that, that's, it's, it's, it just starts off so peacefully and then you get this all out war and Porky's just in the middle of it all. And, you know, this is when Chuck was sort of get, moving back from being the assistant director and he was still an animator, but his influence you can see is getting less and less and Clampus is getting more wilder and wilder. And it's just an insane cartoon and definitely one of the best of the the earlier clampets um anyone want to share their thoughts on what price porky you know i gotta say like having seen this cartoon so many times when i was younger and i found out that daffy duck was in this i was actually shocked because i was like wait daffy duck was in this <laughs> and obviously i see it now but daffy's appearance was like so well defined by tex savory that by the time Clampett was starting to, to use him, uh, especially in another cartoon that we'll, we'll talk about soon, he is well-defined, but just not as much as how, how well-defined as he was before. So he kind of comes off as how directors like Frank Tashton and Norman the Cable would do him, just maybe just w without the right amount of personality or something. But in this car cartoon, like, I don't, yeah, he escalates stuff so quickly and it's the funniest thing. I, I, I almost never get that from a lot of other cartoons with Daffy Duck, even in the, at this point in his career, when he tricks Porky into believing he's the Easter Bunny, it's really, like, nope, just just a, a, a bunch of uh, little ducklings who are a little, a, a bunch of wise quackers, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly right. But the next one is Porky's 5 and 10, which, um, as an Aussie, I've since learned is a parody of, you know, what is it, 5 and Dime or something? Is, it, is that right? right? Yep, yep. Something like that. Yeah, it sounds about right. But you can see here that he's maybe not as interested in Porky because he's, he's not really much in it. Like, it's mainly just Vodkax from what I remember. I mean, Eli, did you want to talk about uh, 5 and 10 for us? Oh, sure. In, in fact, but before I, I say my, my points, because anyone who knows the, the history of the studio will already tell you that Clampett was pretty much designed to just make the black and white Porky pick cartoons but he was able to find loopholes in that as long as it featured porky they didn't have to like star him so they could like have porky in them but the main focus would end up being on these other characters like point of wanted to mess around with and i think unless I'm, I'm mistaken this could be the first one where he really started doing that and like really started to actually take, take advantage of that mentality because the real star of the show are, are these fish who just pretty much steal all, all of porky's stuff and <laughs> just I gotta say, there's some really funny animation in, in here. I don't know who animated like which shot, honestly. I, I don't even know what stuff was done by Chuck or John Carey, the other credit animator, but there's some great experiments, wacky sh shenanigan animation that the animators are doing with the, the different fish. And <laughs> I, what I also find really funny is that there is a, a payback. All other car cartoons would just be like, well, Porky's done, it's like, and get game over. But no, the, the fish get their comeuppance from when, when the tornado comes in. And Porky gets his stuff back. It's it's like those nice little bits of thank you, so, so some closure. You know, I don't think a lot of other cartoons would have really taken advantage of that as much as yeah. this one. Yeah, they were they were really getting the uh, hang of uh, story structure. I found around this time as well, especially with the, you know with the arrival of text. But the next one. The unfortunately named Engine Trouble. Some of the time, you know, westerns were around and all that. So this, and Clampett loved his radio and movie references. Of course, Engine Trouble is a, definitely a love letter to the westerns. Although he does it better in Low Stranger and Porky, which we'll discuss uh, very shortly. 
But this one, look, it's got its prop problematic elements, of course, uh, these days. But it's still a pretty funny short. It's got some really funny gags. You got the guy with the arrows. I keep forgetting his name. You know, I know something I want. To... <laughs> you know? Sloppy Mo. Yeah. That's Sloppy it. Mo. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. That's the one. Sloppy Mo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one's pre pretty good, and you know, and later on, of course, Clamper would remake it in color. But this, there's a lot, definitely a lot of charm in, in this black and white version of the short. But the next one after that is Porky's Party, and this one's just a wonderful little one where I think at one point Gabby was supposed to be in this one allegedly, but according to the behind the scenes material, but they changed it for whatever reason. And you know, this one's. This one's a uh, you know, cute little short. I mean, Fox, what are your thoughts on Porky's Party? Well, uh, of course, I think this cartoon is a party for me. No, but uh, <laughs> it is one of my favorites. It might be as good a Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett collaboration that you're going to get. It has Clampett's quick and clever gags, and it seems to have Chuck's charm and character acting on the dog. But uh, the additional one-shot character steal the show for me. You know, this, um, this goose and this penguin, I think, they look very rubbery and fun. And they chase around the house with the dog, and I think the the dog has rabies. And no, it's just a very quick, fun short. And these additional one-shot characters are much better than uh, what they were gonna use. I think they were gonna use Petunia Pig and that uh, Gabby yeah. character Gabby. character. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, too bad that that goose and a penguin character never came back again. But it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. But the next one is. A big milestone and uh, Foxy will talk about it in a sec but Porky and Daffy well for one thing this is the last short that Chuck Jones worked with uh, Clampett on before Chuck would take over Tashin's unit and do his own thing but Porky and Daffy if you're a fan of the current Looney Tunes cartoons series I mean I am they're not perfect but they're still pretty pretty solid you can tell that they use cartoons such as Porky and Daffy as uh, inspiration, and it's just incredible. You know, even the beginning, Daffy's just jumping on the bed, it's just crazy. But the, of course, once they actually get into the boxing ring, it's just gag after gag after gag. It's just incredible, and with a nice punchline at the end. Fox, uh, what are your thoughts on Porky and Daffy? Well, uh, almost the same as yours, because I was going to say, everyone that is not familiar with this one, please go watch it, because it's everything you would expect and more. To me, this is the true first Clampet Daffy cartoon. Uh, you know, when it was uh, restored in HD last year, it surprised me how hard it uh, made me laugh because I had seen it once before in the Porky 101 DVD, but it looks really good. Did I say Porky's Party was the best Clampet Jones collab? Forget that one, it's this one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's really, really good. So now the next cartoon, there's no importance whatsoever. Now, Porky and Wacky Land, truly forgettable. Nothing happens yeah. in that one. Yeah. But it's seen, it has seen better days. <laughs> yeah, so we gotta move on from that. No, I kid, I kid. <laughs> no, 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 hold on. Let me, let, let me take it from, from here, boys. No, no, no. Everyone knows this is like often were regarded as one of the greatest cartoons of all time. I think it was one of the earliest Looney Tunes to be put in the National Film Re Registry. It was. Some, sometime in the, yeah, so, sometime in the early 90s, I think. And it, it really shows. I, I think there's a really interesting quote in the uh, 50 Greatest C Cartoons book by Jerry Beck. I think for either Frank Tashlin or someone what else said, said this, that the cartoon itself, it was really well, well done, except such a wonderful cartoon wasn't filmed in, in color. And I agree, although I, ironically enough, Frizz Freeling had remade the short to fill a quota in color, and it's not bad, but the funny th th thing is, and I'm, I'm sure, confess this right now, were any of y'all introduced to Porky Wacky Land from the colorized remake Dofer the, the, the Dodo on the Looney yep. Tunes Golden Collection? It's me. <laughs> Sweet. I'm not alone. Yeah, no, I mean, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> War brothers. But in all, ser but in all ser seriousness, like the timing, the animation, the music, the, the voices, it, it, the entire cartoon just puts you on this crazy experience that, oddly enough, the remake, I think, went a little too far in the sound of design of the department. But this one, despite being like all over the, the place, it feels very well fit. And I'm not going to lie, sometimes, even even if I'm out in the, the public, I may just feel the, the need to just shout that up. <laughs> just out of the, the, the blue, you know? <laughs> of course, why not? No one's going to think you're crazy. But see, Manny has got to be even a person. I'm not crazy. I just don't give a darn. That's right. But Manny, you seem to have a, have a bit of a differing view on Porky and Wacky Land. Is that right? Ah, uh, I was afraid you would bring this up. Okay. <laughs> I don't 
I don't dislike Porky and Wackman. It's definitely one of the best shorts that the studio ever made. It was groundbreaking compared to a lot of the other stuff that was coming out. Not only in the Schlesinger studio, but other studios like this. You could see why it left such an impact. But I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, there's a lot of things wrong. Let me start from the beginning. No. But yes, there is. It's, I just don't enjoy it as much as some of the other later and earlier Clampet shorts. And I didn't see this first. I mean, I saw this first as opposed to Doe for the Dodo because I think I first saw Porky and Wacky Land on Cartoon Network sometime in like the early 2000s when I first got into this whole hobby. But I don't know. Like, I kind of feel the same way. This short and jumping ahead a few decades with One Froggy Evening. I recognize the greatness of the shorts and their importance to the studio, and definitely they earn the accolades they get. But I just don't, I don't know. It's not one of my personal favorites, not one of my go-to ones. And I know that's that's a hot take, if there ever was a hot take. But that's I don't know. It's just something. <laughs> He's evil. evil. There's my second sentence evil. reference. <laughs> But and and for some reason too, you know, when I think of the dodo, I mean, Mel Blanc did a great job as a dodo, but I don't know. For some reason, I think more of the dodo from uh, Tiny Toon Adventures that obviously was based off this short. You know, it, I, it's it's a very good short. I, I'm not going to say no, but it's not one of my personal favorites. Boo! No, of course, no. I, I thought yeah, when he brought it up, I said no, no, no. I have to, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> now the next one, you know, uh, after the high of Porky and Wacky Land. We get Porky's naughty nephew, featuring everyone's other favorite character, Pinky. I think that's his name. <laughs> this nephew character is a real such and such. I mean, wow! Like, you know, you have I mean, a mother named Salami. <laughs> oh, look, I, oh, I, I'm a dad of you know of a boy and a girl, and you know, I don't know. He kind of reminds me of my son, but even then, my son is nowhere near that bad. I mean, wow, Ooh, I, just, just crazy. <laughs> I will say that it's fortunate that there is no such thing as Manny's naughty nephew. I mean, my nephew. I mean, my nephew's a teenager now, but he was, he was a, he was a good kid, nice kid. I don't ever think that he ever smacked me in the face with a shovel when I was trying to sleep or something like that. Maybe I don't remember. You know, the brain damage is still kicking in. But uh, <laughs> I will say that part though really cracks me up. With he smacks Porky in the end. And dun, 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 or am I confusing that with the other one, Porky's? But I don't know. They're, the gags are starting to blur together. So is that a good thing yeah, or a bad the, thing? But the Porky Picnic has a uh, has some kind of uh, naughty nephew as well, and I and I think they even yeah. brought the brought the nephew back in the uh, Looney Tunes cartoon series, the current one. But the oh yeah, yeah. Cicero. Yeah. Cicero. yeah, Cicero is another nephew from the comics, I think. So uh, I blend them all together as well. So wow, yeah, so many nephews. But with uh, the naughty nephew, I mean, the best gag in that one is the I think there was like a dump dump truck or something with the sand. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have to admit, I, the cartoon's okay, but that one bit just gets me every time. It's. I have to admit, I I think my my favorite gag next, well, that and the Eddie Cantor gag. I don't know why, but that little tiny baby that has the the, the shovel and Porky trying to tell like don't don't hit me or something. I don't know why. Like, it's I guess it's not actually the, the funniest like gag in the cartoon, but for some reason the. The psychology of it just makes me think, where is this kid's parents? <laughs> Why did you just let him do that? <laughs> oh, but yeah. Won't somebody please think of the children? There's my third uh, reference. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But moving on to an absolute classic, Porky in Egypt. I mean, this one, this <laughs> one, look, um, even if you're not interested in the beginning or whatever, like it's got the best... I guess psychodrama, if you want to call it that, I don't know, where, where the camel's just going absolutely nuts in the desert. It's, wow, that, that just blows my mind every time I see it. And putting aside John Kay as a person, look, he basically said Ooh. that that's what influenced him uh, towards Ren and Stimpy. But Fox, you've got plenty more to say about uh, Porky in Egypt. What are your thoughts on it? I remember before becoming a Looney Tunes fanatic, I knew just a bit about Warner Brothers cartoons and I knew the um, the name of Tex Avery. Uh, and I knew a few of his cartoons. They were wild. They were very insane. And then uh, there was this disc on the uh, Golden Collection. It was all uh, devoted to Clampet cartoons. And I was like, you know, he's exactly copying Tex Avery. So what what is making this man so special that he deserves a uh, separate disc? But then when I saw Pork in Egypt, I think I got it because uh, at this point, Clement is beginning to do 
even crazier takes than Tex uh, has done so far, in my opinion. And uh, this might be my favorite Warner Brothers cartoon of all time, actually. The insaneness of wow. the camel in the middle is uh, one of the best acting I've ever seen in an animated short, both uh, visually and vocally. Completely turns the story on its head and it goes all out on the um, insanity of the camel. I, I actually get goosebumps while watching this camel go insane. You know, you just think, oh, it's, it's Porky, he's going to the desert, some crazy things happen, but... Uh, suddenly it's all about the you know the, the characters going crazy and I think it's maybe as wild as Porky and Wacky Lane but this one is the underdog so I love it more for that. <laughs> now the next one is the Daffy Dock which is quite an interesting one and you know it, it, it's quite wild it's uh, in, in the same vein as uh, Porky and Daffy. I did feel a little uncomfortable with the high and lung joke especially if you know the history behind iron lungs and all that but uh, it's got some got some good stuff in here and clearly clap it's more interested in uh, daffy than uh, porky here but eli what's your uh, what are your thoughts on this one i'm not sure hopefully i, I got the, the, this right i think this is mark Kalser's favorite cartoon of all time albeit one of his, his, his favorites and, and i can definitely see why uh, I, I think clamp later went on, on record to say that he hated this cartoon and I can also see, see why, especially with the aforementioned Iron One gag. I'm pretty sure the story was told Trek Tre Bound doing an Iron One sound effect, and, and he wanted it to be more cartoonish, but I guess maybe because he was rushing this just to, to get it done, uh, Treg was just like, oh, uh, Iron One, uh, well, just make a, a realistic Iron One sound, and yeah, it does make the gag kind of uncomfortable, especially for, for the time. But beyond that, the cartoon itself, in addition to Daffy's wacky personality just kind of getting the better of him, it also kind of like affects others around him, like especially his colleague who, who just kicks him out. It's like, that crazy duck does not understand the seriousness, even though he's just as wacky. But it kind of shows how you got a screwball and everyone else around him is reacting in different ways, whether it be a colleague or a patient just like, no, I, I'm okay, you're, you're just crazy or something. But and, and also, like, I'm sure Bob Cannon hated this animation, like all his Warner Brothers animation, but that stuff he, he did of, of Daffy and Porky just, like, inflating and going up and down, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I, th I think, uh... <laughs> I think I heard, I heard on a commentary that uh, Clampett was working on The Lone Stranger and Porky and he devoted all his time to uh, to that short and he kind of rushed through with the Daffy Duck, despite that one being a lot better. But Well, I, I, I sort of beg to differ. I mean, because the, the next one is The Lone Stranger and Porky, funnily enough. Thanks for the wonderful little segue there, uh, Fox. But <laughs> it's... It's amazing. Look, if you're familiar with, Lone, with, the, with the Lone Ranger, The Lone Stranger is hilarious and it showcases Bob's love of, well, in this case, the, the radio, because the Lone Ranger was huge radio show at the time. And, you know, the audience has really would have gotten a kick out of it, um, especially seeing seeing it visually, the, the, that idea as opposed to the radio. You know, yeah, a few unfortunate stereotypes here and there, but that was also part of the radio show. And it's got some clever gags and it's very cinematic. That's why I like this one. This is Bob taking things to the next level in my view. So, yeah, but I love Lone Stranger and Porky. But yeah, I like the that, next... uh, the, the horse at the end, that's uh, like, uh, oh gosh, uh, boy meets oh, a girl. Goofy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that, actually. Uh, Until Colvig, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's not long after Colvig uh, got let go from Disney, they had like a falling out, and he just did a literal goofy voice <laughs> in this uh, short. And, and I, I still maintain that he did that um, to give the finger to his boss who clearly watched all these cartoons, right? He hadn't. He wasn't focused on anything else. No, no, no. He no, clearly no. watches the competition. He was, you know, he was, he was watching it while, while working on Fantasia and Pinocchio, and he just went... <laughs> yes, clearly. But, but I'm sure it made Pinto feel, feel a lot better about himself, though, for sure. <laughs> but the next one is Porky's Tire Trouble. Now, this one is weird in one way, because this one's gained a little bit of a notoriety in Porky 101 DVD set where they, they reuse that same opening for I think 13 times or something. Monday morning. Na, 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 na. Yep. <laughs> something like that, yeah. Beautiful. Now, you know, it's a great song, but yeah, a lot of people just really didn't like the set for that reason. As for the cartoon itself, it's quite clear that Clampett preferred the dog in this and was exploring some wonderful ways to torment this dog. But Fox, what are your thoughts on uh, Porky's tire trouble? Well, uh, apart from the opening cue, of course, this short has it all in my opinion. Uh, I remember seeing it for the first time and 
at, the, and at that time I didn't even get why the dock was suddenly getting so rubbery till I realized it all takes place at a tire factory so I was, I was being a bit stupid but maybe I shouldn't have watched it uh, on my phone while making breakfast but uh, the character designs of the dog and the walrus are among the most appealing I've ever seen I love the gag of the dog uh, getting the entire car through a little hole in the ground and all of that the characters just all look so fun I, I love this I love to I love to watch this cartoon just because of the uh, the backgrounds and the animation but also the gag so uh, this is classic and the, um, black and, and white carpet and the beginning song too of course yes. of course I uh, <laughs> listen to it all day on my iPod <laughs> That's right, while, while you're jogging and everything. Um, I will to, say, to... speaking of a uh, musical cue, one thing in particular, the very end of the short, when Porky's boss, who's wonderfully voiced by Billy Blackshire, the very end, so, ba, 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 when it ends on those like little upbeat little thing at the very end when he turns to a tire, is one of my absolute favorite ending cues, or one of my favorite <laughs> ending parts of a Carl Sterling score ever. I just wanted to throw that out there. It's just like every time I hear that ending, just, oh, love it. It gives me the chills. All right, sorry for steamrolling. Go ahead. <laughs> no, well, uh, all I wanted to say is uh, I do know that our friend uh, Steph Silly actually did a cover for Monday morning, so that's all. Ah, yes. Nice. That's right. Shout out to Steph. Wonderful, wonderful person she is. The next one is Porky's Movie Mystery, and I can see you guys didn't know and put the hand up for this one, so I'll, I'll dive into it. So it's basically based off a popular movie series at the time, uh, Mr. Moto, and which, of course, played by a white guy playing a Japanese guy, because that was, you know, a thing that <laughs> happened quite a bit. 20 you years know, before we... Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's right. So it was, a, it was a thing, unfortunately. I haven't seen uh, much of it myself, but it was an interesting time because this was just before World War II. So they, they had no problems with having a Japanese character. But of course, as soon as World War II started, it's like, yeah, no more Mr. Moto. No, nope, no, nope, we've got to get out of it. But uh, this, this cartoon is a parody of that. And so you've got Porky, of course, imitating you know, a Japanese guy in, all throughout it. And it's got some nice gags in there. It's kind of forgettable. And if you don't know the Mr. Moto reference, a lot of it might get lost on you. But it, it has its charms. And it, it's still worth watching as a, as a curio. But speaking of curios, Chicken Jitters. See, again, these are these got all these wonderful vague names we're trying to remember exactly, you know, what happens in in some of them, but even I've sort of uh, forgotten part of what, what happens here. So, Fox, you take it from here for this one. Yeah, I picked this one because I think it's just so your run-of-the-mill cartoon. For some reason, I saw this one a few times in a row <laughs> a while back. I think I wanted to edit something or something, but this short is really little appeal to it, I think. It's just a chicken story. At the end, there's a fox involved. Mostly foxes are pretty interesting, but uh, not this one. Some of the jokes are repeated from other cartoons. It's it's worth a watch, but it'll likely be no one's favorite. Mm, that's right. And, you know, speaking of no one's favorite, Christopher Columbus Jr., which, okay, I don't think Columbus is any many people's favorite either. But in, in any case, this shows me that uh, Clamper by this point, he's like, oh, i got to use Porky. Okay, what can I do? Aha, uh -huh, I'm going to cast Porky as another character so he did like you know the previously mentioned movie mystery where he was Mr. Motto here is Christopher Columbus Jr. but it's you know it's just got its uh, spot gags here and there it's not particularly good but again as a curio it's fine and, and it's of course a seldom seen due to the um, depiction of Native Americans in there but if you can give it, give it a watch and then you'll probably not want to see it again really but the next one's a really good one, though, and that's Polar Pals. Although it does have the big sin of having penguins in the North Pole, which penguins don't live in the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere, so... Yeah. This is hey. scientifically inaccurate. Like, Pass. And, and we all know what Manny's going to say. It's like, I hope somebody <laughs> got fired for... <laughs> for you read blunder. my mind, I swear. I, I hope someone was fired for that blunder. <laughs> that's right, but no, no. That's, our, I don't that's care. the fourth I don't... one today. <laughs> I don't watch these cartoons for realism. I'm just having a bit of fun with that. But no, no, it's a fun cartoon. It, it really is. And and, yeah, and Porky's actually used a little bit more in that one too. But Fox, because you put name down for this one, what are your yeah. thoughts on the Polar Pals? Well, on the one hand, this is also kind of a run-of-the-mill story about uh, Porky saving animals on the North Pole. But, you know, this is just such a fun cartoon. All the characters look super appealing and fun. 
it's wonderfully animated, but especially the backgrounds I want to pay attention to because if you just look at this cartoon and just look at the backgrounds, it's actually really soothing and they um, make great use of the great colors, I think, in this one. It's definitely one of uh, Clampett's kind of best around this particular time, especially when his stuff tends to be going to more hit and miss, at least for me anyway. But the next one is Scalp Trouble, which uh, Fritz Freeling would sort of remake, it would take parts of this and then another Tex Avery cartoon. It was a really weird you know, patchwork cartoon, but this one, it's problematic, of course, because of its um, Native American depictions, again, but it's got some nice stuff in it, but it does have one of the darkest jokes in Looney Tunes history, that whole, um, the Ten Little Indians, where he's, like, what, is he killing Native Americans and counting yeah. them? Yeah. Like, it's really dark. It's like, oh, okay, okay. But in any case, Manny, what are your thoughts on Scalp Trouble? This was one of them that I saw growing up on Nickelodeon. And what I mentioned before in commentary that we did for A Feather in His Hair, it was kind of strange that as a kid, they were still showing these things well into the 1990s. And I definitely remember this one. Yeah, the, the Native American imagery does not age well. Some of the things that Porky was saying using certain terms that are considered offensive and yeah that 10 little indians joke i mean i remember learning that song as a kid but now every time i think of it i think of that scene from the cartoon and there's a, another one i think horse hair from the 60s where bugs bunny does the same exact joke but there are some parts of this cartoon that i do like i mean it's cool seeing Clampett starting to you know form daffy's personality Mel Blanc sounds really funny here as Daffy. I just love the whole routine where he's like trying to get the soldiers to wake up. He stabs one of the guys in the in the in the Tukas to to play the uh, the morning call for the troops. And I don't know. The, the the again, I've said in other commentaries, my favorite Looney Tune duo always will be Porky and Daffy. And the interaction between the two of them in this cartoon is really funny, especially jumping out. I said, wake up, wake up. And then he falls asleep <laughs> next to Porky. And the end, the end of that scene where, you know, Daffy's in Porky's arms, like, oh, I didn't know you cared. And it's just, it's so funny and so charming. And, yeah. uh, you know, little bits and pieces some of the gags are pretty funny. I had moments where I was like, ah, oh, that was pretty funny. And then it cuts to a stereotype and also keeps using the same, I forgot what cartoon it is. I think it might have been Sweet Sue from Freeling in 37, but they keep using that scene where the Indians are running forward and then they run through the water. And it's like three other shorts use that same animation. And I was like, man, they really stretched the, the mileage on that one. The next one is a little bit notorious because it's got a few really cringeworthy gags, which I don't know if it pushed things too far or not. And that's, of course, in Porky's Picnic, where our good nephew character comes right back. We all love that, right? Now, we Eli and Manny, you both wanted to talk about this one. So we'll start with you, Eli. Yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I don't I don't like it. But <laughs> that's my view. But what are your thoughts on it anyway? I kind of see it as not like a, a similar rendition, but kind of somewhat similar to those Popeye c c cartoons where he's chasing after Sweet Pea, especially, you know, since this takes place in the zoo to, in the second half of the cartoon. Of course, you, you think of, oh, Will Sweet Pea, that, that, that one Popeye cartoon. But oddly enough, even with, with all the crazy sh shenanigans happening and Porky getting really sick of it, no idea why, but that last gag at the end where Pinky just gets smacked by the squirrel, I don't know why, but that whole ending just made me feel so satisfied. Like, yeah, you deserve that. You're a, you're a little worm, you know? <laughs> Manny, what are your thoughts on that one? Eli pretty much mentioned most of it, but I will say that the beginning where, you know, Porky's about to pick up Petunia, you know, he's combing his hair, his non-existent hair. I know the feeling <laughs> being someone who shaves his head. And uh, I don't know, that whole part over there in the beginning where, you know, Porky's getting ready to go on his picnic with his girlfriend. It's, again, that's what I, even though not every cartoon is, is a gem in the early Clampett filmography, there's just charm to it. And yeah, you could tell that Clampett was like, all right, we, you know, let's let's do something else because Porky. And, and, and it's just, I don't know, it, there's always that debate too where like, you know, you heard from some of the directors, especially Tashlin, that porky was a bland character that he was like mickey mouse that you needed others around him and and porky's my favorite character i've said it before and i think that even though he's not as funny as daffy and bugs and fortunately 
you know, Jones and McKimson later on revamp Porky, the awesome straight man, to Daffy shenanigans. I think a cartoon like this one in the beginning, especially when he's going on the date and he starts telling the, the story to Pinky, even though Pinky's about to do some crazy stuff. It's just that charm and that innocence of Porky shines through in, in the beginning of this short. And I think that's why he's always been like my favorite to this day, even though he's not as LOL funny as his later characters that eventually took his spotlight. The next one up, Wise Quacks, which again, based on its name, you think, what's this one all about? I mean, of course, you know, it's gonna involve a duck, right? <laughs> so Daffy Duck is apparently married in this one. And I don't really remember much of it. And Porky's even also barely in it as well, which goes to show again who uh, Kaipa was interested in. But Fox, what are your thoughts on Wise Quacks? Yeah, you gotta look out with these titles because uh, there's another Fish Feeling cartoon called Wise Quackers. There's another Bob Clement cartoon called The Wise Quacking Duck. So it, the list goes on. Uh, but this one, Wise Quacks uh, from uh, 1939 is uh, a really, really uh, dark one uh, actually. So if you ever want to see Daffy Duck becoming a dad while being drunk and not giving a darn, uh, <laughs> this is the one to go to. I think he does save his uh, his kid later on, but it's surprisingly dark and I just love the guts of this cartoon. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's right. And next up is uh, Porky's Hotel, which I'll mention here that, look, this one, again, Clamper was clearly focused on other characters, but this one is a nice little idea. So you got Porky running a hotel and this guy comes in to rest, gets annoyed by this duck who just won't let him rest. It's just a really weird little, <laughs> little cartoon there. It, it was like an old man or something in a wheelchair, but look, few nice gags but ultimately it's okay it's it's it's, it's it's it is one of the more forgettable ones i think but the next one is jeepers creepers you know of course we all know the song uh so take it away manny oh what what <laughs> <laughs> jeepers creepers where'd you get those i will say my favorite performance of that song remains in another porky short even though it's not clamp it notes to you Anyway, yes. back to you, Anthony. Take it away. Jeepers Creepers. No, I'm not. <clears throat> in, in, in any case, with Jeepers Creepers, the interesting about that one is Peter Colby was supposed to do that, the voice in that one. It ended up being Mel, but it's really weird. But um, it's a nice little one. I mean, some some people don't like it, but I kind of like this one where he casts uh, Porky as like an investigator and, but, and he investigates this haunted house and he got this charming ghost character, which, again, Clampett seems to be more interested in doing, but... That's a nice one. But then the next one is Naughty Neighbors, which, again, got tarnished by the Porky's Tire Trouble music on Porky 101, but is now properly restored. But, again, this one, they're just... Again, Clapper's just focused on these on all these wacky farmyard characters throughout, and it's like, okay, here's Porky, here's Petuna, they skip away, stuff happens, oh, and they come back. Okay, sure, why not? <laughs> oh, I mean... Anyone have, have any thoughts on Naughty Neighbors? It's okay. I, it, it's a pretty straightforward cartoon as far as this list goes. Like they d declare like peace, and the, the opposing sides are trying. They're they're not even trying to, to get along. They're they're only doing so just based on the, the rules. And but then all of a sudden, just like you know, forget this. Let's let's just go to war. And all it takes is a love or peace grenade to bring them all back, which. Isn't that kind of the equivalent of like a love potion, if you think about it? Love <laughs> potion <laughs> number nine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You'd be I do it, like but... the I do like the duet between Porky and uh, Petunia in this one. It's charming, and I and I do love Porky stuttering throughout the song. It's very charming. <laughs> Then next you got Pied Piper, Pied, Pied, Pied Piper Porky, if I can uh, talk correctly. You know, Peter Parker, Pied, 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 you know, I can start talking like that. Um, Pied, Pied, no, Pied, 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 Pied Porky. <laughs> Pied, 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 like I'm trying to do that. But um, yeah, again, you got you got uh, Porky cast as the Pied Piper. And then we did, we were focusing on a cat and a rat for some reason, this one off memory. And one, one, one character is even Rochester, apparently, but... I don't know. I mean, anyone want to give their thoughts on this uh, weird, like? Yeah, you you just uh, you just described it. We've all seen it, and I think that's all there's to say about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert McKimson later made a cartoon that's called Paying the Piper, which is also about uh, Porky Pig being the Pied Piper. But 
Um, it's it's way different and it's in color, so that's all there is to say. I and think. Or we can make a multi-hour podcast episode on the Pi Piper Porky. We can we can examine every frame. I think uh, if the demand is there, we'll get it done. I don't think that I don't think we're we're gonna make it out in the end. But good thought. No, no, of course not. But at least the next one's pretty good, which is the film fan. And again, look, once again, you can see Clamper finding a way to get Porky out of the picture somewhat, where he's like, okay, he just goes into this cinema and then we can see all these um, wonderful gags. But uh, Eli, what are your thoughts on on this one? Being the film enthusiast and cinema fan that I am, this this cartoon does, it stands out from other cartoons at the, the time that were also doing this. I think that there was also like a scrappy cartoon made at Columbia with this similar premise, which coincidentally, I think had some voices done by Mel Blanc. Oddly enough, I, I think it only takes like one or two gags from she was in Acrobat's daughter, mostly like yeah. the, you know, this is Dole Promise or Cold Purple Promise or whatever. Just being like a nerd in film and, and like the history and how movie theaters operated back then. I don't know. It's It's... It feels kind of nostalgic. I remember watching the, the cartoon as a kid and just being like, kids, it, admitted free. Nowadays, that's almost not allowed, even for like family movies, unless the, the kids just, you know, kind of go about it their own way. But, but back then, yeah, it was like, well, whatever. Kids will see a matinee movie that they're going to come regardless if they have their parents. But of course, it shows up at the end. Oh, all the, 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 the kids need to see their parents, not just Porky. <laughs> So at least we get a nice little punchline at the end, but now we get into the forties and we got we start off with Porky's Last Stand, which I gotta say, finally he brings back Daffy. I mean, I'm actually I'm honestly was surprised when I was watching these in order just how long it took for him to use Daffy again because it seems like his Porky and Daffy team ups were just incredible. But I like this one, and, and of course it's because Daffy being the wild character and of course Porky being somewhat the straight man it just works so well and, and, I, and this one was so good oh maybe it's... what I'm gonna do with you with that hamburger <laughs> <laughs> he just still pulls out a giant pole <laughs> instead of the calf yeah I mean, there's not really too much to say about it except yeah like it's just weird how it just took so long to bring back Daffy for this in one of these shorts it's, it's bizarre but the next one is Africa Squeaks and this one sadly look well, for starters, I'm happy it's on Porky 101, completely intact, and we, and we can see it for what it is. And yeah, it, it is a bit of a hard watch today, but there are some e very interesting things. I mean, Manny, what are your thoughts on Africa Squeaks? So this one was a bit of like a, ooh, uh, an intriguing one for me when I first got into this hobby, because I forgot how long ago it was, but back on the old, I think it was the miscellaneous blog or the old Looney Tunes Merry Melodies webpage that your buddy and uh, Looney Tune fanatic uh, Matt Hunter used to run as well as John Cook and others from that time period. And they had like the list of the rarest Looney Tune Merry Melody shorts and they had, you know, the 1969 Engine Trouble and I think something with Bosco and this cartoon was on that list. And they were like, yeah, you know, it's very problematic, blah, 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 blah. And then I found out that they did air this cartoon. I think it was a redrawn, colorized version on Nickelodeon. And I saw, and it was like chopped down to four minutes. And a part of me was like, what was the point of showing it? Like, it's so trimmed down. It doesn't work. And once I was able to get the Porky Pig 101 DVD set, this was actually the first cartoon I saw because of the notoriety behind it and the history. And, you know, I wanted to see it full version. And... I mean, it's all right. Yeah, the the stereotypes are brutal to watch. That's that you, it, it goes without saying. I will say though, I'm a sucker for you know the music in in the beginning of this one when you hear the native singing Congo, and yeah, if you could completely separate the imagery and just listen to the singing, it's great. It's funny how uh, Tex Avery started making you know the spot gag cartoons really popular. He started with the Isle of Pingo Pongo and he kept running with it. And this was Clampett's chance of doing a spot gag cartoon. And you, obviously they have Robert C. Bruce doing the narration for this one. And there's some jokes that, you know, I had a little chuckle behind them. And some of them I was like, oh, it's really neat. You know, the trunk gag of the deer attacking the vulture, which was later used in, in uh, Crazy Cruise. And, the, and this is one of the few times that uh, Warner Brothers Short actually got to use the real celebrity they were making fun of, Kay Kaiser, during the ending with a scene in the jungle where they're all singing and dancing. And again, the music is charming. 
I don't know a lot about Kay Kaiser, but that scene right there, I was like, man, I can see why he was so popular at that time period. I mean, it's it's not what a clamp it's best, but it's intriguing when it comes to the music, and it's intriguing if you know the history behind it. And again, like the complete short censored version that was on Nick sometime in either the late eighties or nineties. I wouldn't have remembered. I was too young, but yeah, yeah. Not fair, fair enough. And yeah, the music is definitely energetic in that one. But um, the next one, and I know this is one of Fox's favorites, um, Alibaba Bound. I mean, I remember as a kid, I watched this to to death. Same I, here. I really, I, Same. It, I in the, <laughs> the colorized version, and I, I think it's quite fun, despite there being yeah, it's a little bit problematic these days. But it it, it had it has its charms. But Fox, what are your thoughts on that one? Well. Uh, of course, I also watched the redrawn version as a kid on a VHS tape. Uh, it even had a very bad Dutch dub, so um, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> why I loved it. Uh, it made this short more than uh, hilarious, because it was kind of bad, but it was so bad that it's good. Some of this animation is absolutely insane, and I remember some of the poses making a big uh, impression on me as a kid. But I could tell this was an early Looney Tunes short, even back then. So I remember wearing this VHS tape out. It also had the um, cartoon Amateur Night from Tex Avery on it. So uh, these two I really loved. And, you know, I really wore the tape out. So at one point I couldn't see it anymore. And so <laughs> that was really, yes. I remember I was trying to repair the VHS tape, but um, it was no, no use. But uh, about this cartoon, the only bad part is, you know, it has a few bad parts because there's a lot of edgy stuff. But at the very end, there's the suicide bomber. And, you know, I can handle a little bit um, of violence, but he's uh, producing this awful sound. Something like meep meep, and it's not uh, the Roadrunner sound. And I remember low lowering my uh, volume because I didn't want to disturb my housemates with this sound. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it's, it's, an alarm it's not a, on the level of home. <laughs> no, I don't think out of the way. I don't out think of the way. did this. <laughs> yeah, <out> of, <laughs> of course, of course. So we've got a, a whole run of forgettable ones, really, after Alibaba Bound. I mean, starting off with Pilgrim Porky. Uh, again, this is uh, Clampett's another attempt at um, doing some spot gear cartoons all around the guise of basically Porky guiding the pilgrims to, to America. And some funny gags, yes, but again, pretty forgettable. I mean, and Slap Happy Pappy, which is the one after that, I mean, my goodness, that one is barely even a Porky cartoon at all. That one's just uh, um, like an Eddie Cantor thing. Is, and that's pretty much what it is and the whole gag is of course with Eddie Cantor just going wanting a son so badly and that's pretty much it thankfully though the short does work even if you're not familiar with Eddie Cantor so yeah there, there is that Porky's Poor Fish <laughs> this one is probably really funny if you're aware of Clampett not wanting to really use Porky that much because it's like okay there's a fish shop there's some spot gags hi Porky sing, sing a song Porky bye Porky and see you later. <laughs> that's it. That's Porgy's Poor Fish right there. Thankfully, with the Chewin' Bruin, that's the next one. And Fox, I know you want to talk about this one. This one, okay, yes, they get Porky out of the way again because, you know, it's, it's through the guise of one guy telling Porky a story and Porky's a kid again, apparently. But Fox, what, what are your thoughts on the Chewin' Bruin? I just wanted to say that I think it's a, it's a very weird one because who thinks of these stories? You know, it's it's very bare bones, you know, bare, got it. But it's all about uh, tobacco. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's about uh, tobacco uh, uh, and a bear who wants to eat it. And, you know, you can see Clampett is really starting to get tired of Porky as he is barely in it. He's okay. getting very tired of them. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. But we've got Patient Porky, which, again, the Clampets seem to be more interested in this wacky cat uh, in, in this one who's a patient that pretends to be a doctor. But this was quite a good one. I mean, Manny, what are your thoughts on that one? This is one I saw often growing up, uh, along with the Daffy Dock. I would, if you had to make me choose, I would go with Daffy Dock. It's kind of strange that so soon into his career, you know, Clampa was already like making a remake, and I guess the cat was a, a, a was an attempt to try to make another wacky character in the vein of Daffy Duck. Um, for me, it's like I said, it's it has its moments. The I will say the part with uh, Dr. Christian and the patients with the owl yelling 
Uh, you know, I can't talk above a whisper. That part always cracks me up. It's hilarious. The yes. cat has his moments. And yes, there is. I remember, I think it was about a year or so ago, that I had no idea that the cartoon... Well, I knew that the cartoon was computer colorized, but I didn't know that the entire short was filmed. And it came up randomly on my YouTube where the scenes with the Rochester stereotype was computer colorized. I was like, wow, I was like shocked that that was there. So I remember the cartoon mainly for the yelling owl and some of the cat shenanigans and that really awkwardly inserted Rochester stereotype. Although I will say some of the puns he's throwing out there is, are kind of funny. And this is another early appearance of the early version prototype. I don't know what you want to call it. I refuse to call it Happy Rabbit because that doesn't exist. But the very early version of Bugs Bunny does make a quick cameo, which is kind of neat. Oh, you love Happy Rabbit. Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be happy and I love wabbits, but I don't like Happy Rabbit. <laughs> Fair enough. Before we can continue, I just want, want to add one thing. I don't know if, if y'all thought thought this when we first watched the, the cartoon, but this might have this this might have just been my dumb like ten year old mind while watching this cartoon for the first time. Did any of y'all y'all also think that like that that one scene where the crazy cat like puts an X ray up to Porky's stomach and that whole cake where we get just one slice off? He was trying to stop Porky. Did did any of y'all think he wanted to cut open Porky's stomach? To eat that cake. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because, you know, that uh, the part where you see the cake, I used to think, and thank you, Bob Clampett, for warping my young mind. I do remember that scene that I'm like, when you eat your food, it reforms in your stomach or going back to Porky's movie mystery when the villain is eating the apple and like you see it reform in his stomach when he chews it. I used to think that was realistic. <laughs> it's not. Not in cartoon land. <laughs> oh, it's not boy. real. Oh no. <laughs> but moving on to prehistoric Porky, and this one marks the first time in a while actually that Porky is basically a main character in his own short, which is interesting. And this one's got a charming vibe to it. I, I like these weird prehistoric type uh, cartoons like Daffy and the Dinosaur and all that stuff. And this one is right up there with, with, uh, for me as being just a nice little cartoon set around this time. And it's also, even to me, a kind of precursor to what Clamper would eventually do with Beanie Cecil. And you can just see that he sort of has an interest in dinosaurs and all that there. And it's a great cartoon. I, I personally I personally love it. But the next one is the Sourpuss. And I know Eli's got some things to say about it. I know he was on the commentary um, before it was taken down and, and I'll rework it later dis on. Disclaimer, anyone who, who loves this cartoon cover you, your ears <laughs> because i'm not actually a fan of, of this cartoon and it and no it's it, it's not because of well it's not just because of the, the cat's annoying voice which you know i i have a, a pet peeve of like having animal characters sound like how how they they, they, they normally would like the i love the, the fleischer cartoon hold it i think it's brilliant but the one thing about it that annoys me is that all the cats sound like this <laughs> but outside of that though i feel like half of the cartoon ne nearly half of the cartoon is over but before it really gets going with porky and, and his cat uh actually fishing and beyond that too i don't know like some some gags i feel are just weirdly paced and I, I, I do like the, the the fish, but he can, can get a little annoying. Oddly enough, the oh, 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 look at the, the stung cat. Oh, I like that, that that gag a lot more in the next cartoon we we'll be talking about, because it was shorter, obviously. But the more I, I watch this cartoon, the more I just go, eh. But I do like the, the end gag that that that, that caught me off guard. It's funny that voice of the cat now, and and also Eli's uh, imitation of it. I'm like I'm thinking. Did, did Trey Parker and Matt Stone use that as the inspiration for Mr. Hankey? Because that's exactly what that voice reminds me of. Yeah. <laughs> but we're nearing the end, actually, because there were two cartoons now that Clamp had co-directed with uh, Norm McCabe, and the reason for that is that Clamp had been uh, sick at the time. And the first of them is the Timid Toreador, which I watched constantly as a kid as well. It was always available. And I never even knew what tamales were until recently, too, when I did the commentary oh. and asked everyone, what is a tamale? Uh, uh, tamale, though, that they're delicious. I will try when I uh, eventually make it over to the U.S. But Manny, what are your thoughts on the Timid Toreador? I love this short. I, too, used to watch it religiously on Nickelodeon. It was one of my favorite shorts that came on. I love the music in the beginning with La Cucaracha, which 
is authentic Spanish being sung. I am, you know, a Spanish speaker, so I do recognize the lyrics. And there is uh, a reference to a particular herb in the lyrics, if you pay attention really closely. And I just love the, the musical atmosphere of it in the beginning. The gags with the bull and just the bull himself always makes me laugh. And I, Mel Blanc is the announcer just talking about, oh, Ponchi Pancho, he goes behind the wall. And, you know, whatever he says. And it's just, I, I love the energy of that of uh, the scene during the bull fight. Yeah, the bull is a really funny character. I wish he stayed in more. And I do have a soft spot for Norman McCabe's cartoons, minus the really bad stereotype ones. Norman McCabe, along with Art Davis, are the two directors that I'm like, man, I wish I got to see more of this stuff. It's a shame that they didn't. I sometimes feel the same way about Hardaway and Dalton. I'm kidding, of course. But <laughs> it's, definitely a, Good boy. it's definitely a very charming short. Unfortunately, the next one, Porky Snooze Reel, okay, it features one bit I absolutely love when uh, Porky Pig transforms into Lulia, and it's just a s stupid animation of, of him doing that, which makes me laugh. But it's a forgettable spot gag short. It, you know, it's okay to, to watch it, but aside from that one really strange Lulia part, it, yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Wait, wait, hold on. Answer the question. You are a pincher, are you not? But the next one is... An interesting one. Well, first of all, it's one of only two shorts that were done in color by Clampett's original unit. And this one is also uses a theme that was done constantly in the 30s, but then was kind of stopped as of the 40s. And that's, of course, things coming to life in a grocery store thing that they constantly did. And, you know, it's quite quite a charming little short, if maybe, to, to me anyways, mostly forgettable, except for the appearance of Superman at the end. But Eli, what are your thoughts on Goofy Groceries? I remember watching this cartoon when I was younger and just immediately thinking, who made this? Because this, this doesn't feel like anything any of the other directors would have done. And then I found out it was, it was Bob Clampett. I was like, makes a lot of sense. Because, I mean, you, you could argue that maybe Tex could, could, could have done this, especially because he was still at, at the studio at, at that point. But what's funny is, it, it's funny that, that, that they mentioned this being in color. I don't think a lot of people know this, but according to, to research, I believe production manager, whatever his role was, um, at the Termite to Terra studio where, where the Looney Tunes were being made, not the, the Merry Melodies, but the Looney Tunes, Ray Katz, I, I don't know what happened specifically, but, but it was along the lines of some management change up for, from him, and the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies were finally able to, to change and not all. So the, the, the Looney Tunes wouldn't all just have to be Porky Big cartoons. And that's also why Tex Avery's first Looney Tunes cartoon, The Wild of the Haunted Mouse, is actually the first one-shot Looney Tunes cartoon. And Goofy Groceries is like, finally, like, this is probably what, what, what Clampett was begging for for so long, his very first one-shot cartoon. And I feel like but by that point, he and his crew were just going all out. They are just like, Let's have so much fun with this. I feel like all through throughout the, the, the cartoon that they're just there's so many like fast paced gags, so so many many good food puns, so many like a lot of very wonderful John Kerry and Izzy Ellis animation throughout. And the ending, okay, well the ending is you know outdated, not not that that, that part, but just the, the the payoff of the the villainous gorilla just cracks me in the up and especially they, they they beat the fleshers to it but that superman guy is just like wow they caught me off guard you know yes exactly and uh, unfortunately the second of the two color shorts by this unit farm frolix is uh, okay at least in my mind i some of the jokes work and this is clearly his attempt at doing like an actual tex avery style one very close but didn't quite work i mean what are your general thoughts on that one guys farm frolics okay i actually like it i think it's, like it? it's kind of funny honestly <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, it's got uh, just enough gags for, 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 for me to remember but especially well yeah the the running gag with the the piggies oh dear every day the same thing but there's there's just these little ones that like wouldn't be that funny without like the odd timing like the big eared mouse or the, or the mouse who's like oh you're friends with the, the, the cat or or are they you know <laughs> yeah so it's got a few th things good about it but ultimately it's okay but i love the next one which is back to black and white it's a coy decoy which well it's a porky short barely again but it's more of a daffy short really if you think about it and you know this is like a precursor to the well admittedly better book review but 
this one's got, got its f funny moments. It has one very unfortunate gag, but the rest of it, wow. Especially the the, the, the scene where the the female <laughs> duck. Yeah, there's a there's a reason why even the colorized version is looked on with the disdain. Like, why would they include that? You know? Yeah, it's pretty weird. I mean, anyone else have, have any thoughts on Koi Decoy? Because I, I mean, I absolutely love that one personally. But yeah, it's a fun one, I think, for sure. Yeah. I, I believe it was lost for a long time, or at least uh, people were only able to find the, the redrawn version. So people are really glad it uh, appeared on the uh, Porky Pig DVD. That's right, because we know it's not going to appear uncut anywhere else. That's because of that one really unfortunate scene. And me, John Doughboy, wow, I mean, if there was ever a cartoon where Clamp was like giving the finger in terms of using Porky, it's like, you know what? I'm going to do a spot gag cartoon, I have Porky introduce it, and no framing device, nothing. <laughs> but He was done. He was pretty much done with Porky at this point. <laughs> exactly right. But as for the short itself, it's it's definitely an interesting curio as, as a wartime short before America got into the war. So it's got a lot of interesting stuff in there about how America were preparing, you know, the defenses and all that, because that one was released in 1941, and this was just before uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, happened. And the next one is an interesting curio as well. It's um, We the Animal Squeak, and the title won't make any sense to a lot of people today because it's actually based off um, a radio show of the time. We, we come on the radio and tell their weird and wonderful stories, and in this case, of course, Hey, but again, palms off Porky as just a bit of a radio host and gets this really interesting cat character to describe it. I will say with this one, it, it goes on a little bit too long, but there's some amazing acting in it, especially with the cat, mother cat's despair, and just, wow, well, you actually feel sorry for this cat, I've got to say, but Eli, um, you you want to talk about this one, what are your thoughts on We, the animals, squeak? I gotta say, I'm gonna be completely honest, this is probably my favorite later Clampett cartoon in his original crew. Like, I do uh, agree that, that it does drag on a, a few points, but it, it feels so well constructed, very concise, and the mice in, in there, I just... I remember them so well because they're they're just so diabolical and evil. Like they're the kind of foes you don't want to mess with, but at the same time, you can tell that they're also very paranoid and scared of the cat. And even with them kidnapping her kitten, and it really isn't until the end where it's just like, well, we're screwed. We're we're, we're getting beaten up, and then the, the end is just like, oh, is she actually not scared of mice? Well, face and be jabbers. It's it's a great cartoon to watch on St. Patrick's Day, and also can. Also, considering that Clampett himself was Irish American, it just fits so well. He must have had a lot of fun having Sarah Burner put on her very authentic Irish accent. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 that was pretty good. And just to round it up, we've got two left, and Fox um, loves these two. I mean, first up is the Henpeck Duck, which I love this one, especially that really awkward doorknob gag I keep remembering about this one. I mean,. You know, if you've seen the cartoon, you'll know the doorknob <laughs> gag. Everyone knows about that. And of course, I guess his marriage from the previous cartoon wasn't going so well by this cartoon. But Fox, what are your thoughts on the Henpeck Duck? Well, all this handful of last cartoons are uh, really great, including the uh, the Weedy Animal Squeak one that was just mentioned. But the Henpeck Duck is another one with guts. Uh, the short has uh, Daffy's wife repeatedly shouting, I want a divorce, I want a divorce. I can't imagine a Disney cartoon playing with themes like divorce like this, but other than that, this is a solid and uh, funny gag-oriented Daffy cartoon. Uh, the door no doorknob joke. Um, oh wait, that doorknob joke. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's a very dirty joke. That's a very dirty. Joke. That one where Clampett would we'll have to eh, make a, a little joke to the the, the Hayes Code officer to be like, "Hey, remember that?" It, it was just so he could distract him long enough. <laughs> look, look over there. There's a spider in the corner. Where? Okay. Spiders. Uh, uh, and then the yeah, moving go. But yeah, so one, this one, uh, very risque and uh, Porky again as a strange role as the judge, I think, in this one. Yeah, so, <laughs> and of course we've got Porky's Pooch, which is the last hurrah, which for me was more memorable for the use of the backgrounds, how they, the backgrounds have the, um, the all photos basically, which, which is very interesting. I thought it was great as an experiment and it just shows that even with his original unit, he was still doing some amazing thing at the time. And more people would know this cartoon better in its remake done by Chuck Jones years later, but this one's quite a nice cartoon. But Fox, yeah, you, you want to talk about this one too. So 
Your thoughts on Porky's Pooch? Yeah, like you said, uh, the background is made uh, made up of photographs, uh, but I only noticed it when I saw it for like the fifth time because I must have been too focused on the animation before to notice it. So kind of stupid of me again. Uh, <laughs> but the weirdest thing is uh, how the same exact plot and jokes were copied by Chuck Jones years later for the Charlie Dog cartoons. It's weird because Jones had a habit of blaming Clampett for taking credit for ideas that weren't his. Apparently Jones disliked Clampett after Chuck didn't receive the screen credits he thought he deserved on the collaborative shorts. So it's strange to see him just copying this Clampett cartoon after Clampett had just uh, left the studio uh, actually. So uh, what is also strange is that Warren Foster is credited for the story of this one. And I expected him to also be the story man for Chuck's first Charlie Daw cartoon, Little Orphan Airedale. But no, they are Ted Pierce and Michael Maltese. It really la- makes a man confused. <laughs> it's yeah, all confused. when you're when you're a rival with someone, you kind of make a hypocrite out of yourself. I should know, but I, you know what I mean. <laughs> of course, of course. So that's pretty much going to do it for part one. And just to wrap things up, though, because the part two will, of course, feature Bob Clamper taking over Tex Avery's unit, because there were a few cartoons released just before I think Porky's Pooch or Hempback Duck, that because of production times and release dates and whatnot, there was no clean cut difference between one unit and, and the other. But we'll just go, we quickly go around the, the table, virtual table, so to speak, when Clapper took over Texas unit. We'll start with you, Fox, because I know you're, it's getting late for where, where you are. <laughs> well, yes, what are your general so, thoughts? When someone says the Warner Brothers style, you know, the, the classic Warner Brothers style in branch of cartoons, the Clampett cartoons are really uh, the ones you think of, uh, the color cartoons. And I think especially the later ones like uh, Piggy Bank Robbery and Baby Bottleneck are among the very best the studio ever put out and that's all i'll say <laughs> no fair enough fair enough manny just briefly yeah just general thoughts on part yeah the second half of clampett's career at warner's i mean the first half you see the beginnings of an amazing career happening and despite some of the limitations he had clampett for the most part made it work but all i can really say is the best is yet to come yep and finally eli you've, you've got somewhat the final word here <laughs> Your thoughts on the second half? Boring. <laughs> no, no, no. It all, it all just, no, the, the complete opposite. I think a, a lot of like diehard Luigi fans tend to uh, prefer the, the later Clampic cartoons. And I can totally see why. And he, I think he, even Clampett himself kind of disowned a lot of his black and white cartoons. And, and I'm sure he tended to prefer his, his later stuff because, you know, the, the energy is a, a lot more zany, the, the pacing is more tight. The animation's a lot zanier, and and even though the voice acting gets more, you know, off of the wall and bonkers and all that. That being said, I, I think it's important to understand that even if you prefer his later shorts that in Texas or original in it, I don't think that his level of like perfection in craft and storytelling and gags would have been anywhere near as intact without his experience at first because there's several elements in his earlier unit that definitely seeped in to his little later cartoons that you know maybe the pacing's slower and maybe the voice acting's not quite there or something but regardless i think what people what people tend to forget is that clampett was working with the lowest b- budgets at the time and the shortest schedules and nothing against his animators that they were really gifted i guess that they just like weren't up to the snuff as other animators like you know bobby kimson or you know even chuck jones or you know other people ken, ken harris and all that but regardless like he really made the most out of them and made some really fun car- car- cartoons i mean not all of them were winners you know you, you, you came and make winners over there you know and you know he, he didn't always make little winners in the later period but what i'm saying is without his original growth as a cartoon director in his earlier units i don't think he would have had the the right amount of confidence and the right amount of security within himself to to be like let's go full-blown nuts yeah i I think a lot of his colleagues who don't later look back is just like yeah he was nuts and we loved him bill melendez especially if you listen to his interviews or where where he talks about about clip he he adored them he absolutely loved working with, with with him he was an absolute delight and so it shows like clampett carried that throughout his little later career like he absolutely adored them may i recommend the cartoon it's a grand old nag with charlie horse that clampett made it's Ooh. it's like this, 
yeah oh come on <laughs> but you know it's a one-off cartoon but like it also shows stan freeberg's range as a voice actor outside of, of warner brothers definitely it's got some great gags some great timing and of course if, if you're a fan of you know time for beanie or beanie and cecil remember that maybe they're they're not like his warner's cartoons but they have a lot of their their charm snorky yeah. snorky a big yes. snrky or you know what I mean. <laughs> of course, of course. But just to wrap it up here, as always, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me for part one. We'll have a new roundtable for part two, just to mix things up. Not that I don't think these gentlemen are any good or anything, but <laughs> no, but th guys, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, guys, thank you so much for listening or watching, depending on where you've seen this. And until next time, take care. And Sleep be tight, everybody. That's all, folks. <laughs> Them's the conditions that prevail.